During the Korean War, military aviation tactics changed drastically from the days of World War II. It was the first war to see fighter jets and dogfights and it really exposed the weaknesses of the US's fighter jets. The Soviet made MiG-15 was at the forefront of this wake-up call. The US Air Force realized this and requested a new plane, one specifically built to outperform the MiG-15. The task of building this new jet fighter fell on a man who usually overdelivered when called upon for a job. Lockheed's Kelly Johnson, the creator of Skunk Works. Kelly had already been the chief engineer over the P-38 Lightning and the F-80 Shooting Star at Lockheed, so tasking him with building a new fighter for the Air Force only made sense. Kelly Johnson was a practical man. He figured if he wanted to know how to beat the MiG-15, he needed to ask the pilots that were flying against them in battle. He traveled to Korea and spent a month visiting air bases all over the peninsula and speaking with pilots about what they wanted. Raw speed. That's what these pilots wanted. Kelly Johnson returned from Korea and was determined to build the world's fastest and highest flying jet fighter. He worked with his team over the next year to design and develop the aircraft and Lockheed approved his team's design on Halloween Day 1952. The first prototype was dubbed the XF-104 and first flew in 1954 at Edwards Air Force Base. During testing, the plane had a tendency to pitch up, causing it to enter a tumble, so automatic pitch control was added to fix this issue. Initially the plane was outfitted with a downward firing ejection seat. This was due to early ejection seats not having the power to eject the seat high enough to clear the tall T-tail of the F-104. This would later prove to have deadly consequences. The brand new J-79 engine was a revolutionary design, featuring adjustable turbine blades which could change angles depending on temperature and altitude conditions, maximizing performance at all altitudes. But there was a deadly flaw in the early models of this engine. If the plane was left out in the sun on a runway for long periods of time, and became very hot, the compressor blades would have a tendency to close completely during takeoff, resulting in the engine flaming out. An F-104 pilot in this situation would almost certainly be doomed. The only option would be to eject, which would fire the ejection seat directly into the ground, killing them instantly. 21 F-104 pilots were killed in this manner. Ejection seat technology advanced and the F-104s were all eventually changed over to topside ejecting seats. The plane had a short 21 foot wide wingspan but was 54 feet long, making it look like a rocket with small wings. When other engineers and government contractors came in to take a look at the plane, its wings were always a topic for concern. The wings were incredibly thin, only 4 inches wide at their root, and knifed down to only 16 thousandths at their leading edge. The leading edge was so sharp that air crews would place rubber edge guards on them when working on the plane to prevent injuries. The F-104 was incredibly fast, with a cruising speed of over 500 miles per hour. It was the first plane to ever fly Mach 2. If pilots wanted raw speed, Kelly Johnson had certainly delivered. The F-104 had a top speed of over 1400 miles per hour. It was the first plane to ever hold simultaneous records for speed, altitude, and time to climb. It not only looked like a missile, it flew like one as well. On May 7, 1958, Major Howard C. Johnson broke the world altitude record by flying to 91,243 feet at Edwards Air Force Base. Then, on May 16, 1958, Captain Walter Irwin set a world speed record of 1,404 miles per hour over a 15-mile course at Edwards Air Force Base. The plane also set several rate-to-climb records as well, including a climb to 82,000 feet in 266 seconds. On December 6, 1963, Major Robert Smith set a world altitude record of 120,800 feet in an F-104. All of these records clearly made the F-104 one of the fastest, most high-performing jet planes in the entire world at the time. The F-104s were armed with a single M61 20mm cannon and up to four AIM-9 air-to-air missiles. There was a serious issue with the cannon when it first started being tested in flights. The empty brass would sometimes be injected inside of the airplane, striking hydraulic lines, critically crippling the aircraft and causing them to crash. Two F-104s were lost in testing due to the same issue, which was corrected soon after. 
The new GE J79 engine soon had its compressor blade issues corrected. It was a powerful engine producing 9,300 pounds of thrust normally and over 14,000 pounds with afterburners. The F-104 was theoretically capable of a much higher top speed, but friction with the atmosphere caused excessive heating of the skin of the aircraft, so the top speed was recommended to not exceed 1,400 miles per hour at 35,000 feet. The F-104 met every requirement that was asked of it, but by the time the plane was put into production, it was already up against its own demise. The U.S. Air Force had changed strategy. The Pentagon believed that the Soviet Union had massive fleets of bombers due to propaganda that was being fed to U.S. spies in Russia. This sent a chill up their spine. They decided that the only way to combat this threat was to develop and deploy as many interceptor-style fighters as possible. This meant long-range capability was paramount. Performance was only needed to be average, since they would be shooting at large bomber groups, not nimble fighter planes. Suddenly, the F-104 was out of a job. The U.S. Air Force ordered two new planes to fulfill this new role, the F-104 Delta Dagger and the F-106 Delta Dart. Longer range and higher weapon loads were the new name of the game. The F-104 had neither of these traits to offer. Thin wings meant smaller fuel capacity and light weapon loadouts. The United States moved away from the F-104 pretty quickly, but Lockheed found many countries around the world that were very interested in purchasing the airplanes. So U.S. allies became the principal operator of the F-104. It was the standard NATO fighter all the way up until 2004. Germany, Italy, Japan, Denmark, Canada, Norway, and many other countries all purchased large numbers of the F-104s. The plane went on to have a lengthy service life around the globe, with a total of 2,578 planes being built by various countries under license from Lockheed over its service life. The last operational starfighters being retired from service in October of 2004. The United States only purchased a total of 296 starfighters, all of which were completely out of service by 1969. The F-104 did service time during Vietnam, flying 2,937 combat sorties during the war, having 12 planes lost to various causes. Well guys, there's my F-104 video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to try to put up a video per week. Like, comment, subscribe, give me some suggestions in the comments. Um, I appreciate all you guys' advice about how to make my videos a little bit better quality. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm taking a lot of that to heart, believe it or not. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the videos. Um, have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks.